Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Jean, many thanks for taking part. Um, maybe if you'd just start off by identifying yourself. Um, um, do you want my name as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, I'm Jean Seaton and um, I wrote the last volume of the Official History of the BBC, but before that I'd spent 30 years writing about media history and politics in the media, and I'm the director of the Orwell Prize. And how did you become an academic? How did I become an academic? Yeah. Has it been your whole life? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, how did I become an academic? Um, I was a revolting student. Um, and then I went to what was seen as the absolutely best sociology department in the country, which was Essex in those days. And my parents, who were absolutely lovely, my father was a butcher, um, it had long been my observation that the only thing they really talked about was what was on telly. And the house was always littered with newspapers, with the nights, with decisions, the night programmes, circled on them. <clears throat> and so I got. I just thought that was a very interesting thing. So I started to do work on the media. So I've always worked on the media, really. And then really, in an odd kind of way, and then I started a book which is called Power Without Responsibility with James Curran, <clears throat> which in its day was fantastically innovative because we went back to the history of the media in order to situate policy issues about the media. So James went back to the 17th century of the press. And that book, which is about to come out in another edition, has been never been out of print for 30 years, translated into a dozen languages. I suppose that got me into how, how if you look at the past of institutions, um, they don't tell you what's going to happen in the future, but there's no other evidence that half as good about the problems you may face. And how did you become the official historian of the BBC? I have no idea, really. Um, that, well, in, in a technical way, two gentlemen from the BBC arrived at my office door. And I think I thought they were coming about something, something to do with the BBC. I'd already written quite a lot about the BBC. I'd, in particular, there was a nasty... Pr uh, uh, I think what I'll do... Can I, can I shut this? Oh, yes, I'll do that. I'm just going to cut for a second. I'm really sorry. actually. So how did you become the official historian of the BBC? Um, I have no idea, is one answer. But um, two gentlemen from the BBC arrived at my office door. Uh, I thought about something to do with the BBC, but I didn't know what. I mean, I knew that, but I didn't know what. And they asked me to do it. Um, and to say you could have knocked me over with a feather and picked me off the floor afterwards. Um, I've now looked at the papers around the appointment of Lord Briggs, which was completely riveting and quite a complicated process. Um, and it's very interesting because the official history emerged out of a political crisis. And the political crisis was really Suez. And during Suez, lots of people stood up in Parliament and said, all sorts of things about the control of the BBC during the war, which weren't true. And so the BBC wanted the history as a aid to record, I think particularly, how it had behaved during the Second World War. And secondly, in a sense, as a kind of bulwark against that political misappropriation of the history. So that's how they set up Lord Briggs. Lord Briggs was closed um, for all sorts of reasons. For, you know, came to the end of um, his contract. Uh, he was closed quite bl brutally in a way. And um, then by some mysterious process, which certainly, I mean, I know Asa quite well, um, but his list of possible people certainly didn't include me. So some internal process goes on and these people arrive at my door and they ask me to write the official history. I, I now realise really at that point I should have put my foot down. Um, In what way? Oh, I, th I think... I think... Uh, well, you know how the BBC is. I, I, I couldn't put my foot down partly because I hadn't finished an, a book I was already writing on. I was doing something else, whereas the BBC thinks you can just drop everything. You know, and I had a full-time job, and they somehow thought they were commissioning me, perhaps like a... 
perhaps like an independent television maker, to make something, as if somehow I bid for it, but I hadn't. I think I should have thought through the processes that Lord Briggs had, and I should have understood those and demanded more of those. So Lord Briggs had a large internal team of people, most of whom were sort of, as it were, BBC saints, like Frank Gillard and John uh, and Leonard Mile. I mean, you were really important players. Um, and I, I wasn't, I was offered a fee, but I wasn't offered the money really to do it, although it always takes involvement. The archive always has to, takes a lot of money. Getting archives ready for somebody to use takes a lot of money. So I think I should have been a bit more demanding, I think, all the way through, but I just don't think I understood the process. But there we go. So they asked me, and I went away and raised an arts and humanities research grant, um, which then had a completely different set of drivers, which I think is absolutely appropriate in the modern world. They had young scholars, PhD scholars, uh, you know, other the people who have to own bits of work themselves who work on it. Um, and then later, I was very alarmed because none of that paid for me to have time off. I mean, that's how academic grants are, they're mad. You can get them to do something called research, but you can't get them for yourself. So I went back to Mark Thompson, we got a bit more money, and then I put in for a Levy Hume, which got me some time off. So it was quite a complicated process of recruiting, um, but it was obviously a fantastic... What was your brief? Oh, to write the next volume. And I, I chose the time span because it seemed to me that you could have gone to the end of Mike Checkland, and in a way that might have been a good thing to do because I think Mike Checkland is a very underestimated director general. Um, but it seemed to me that in a way lots of Checkland's reforms really lead into however contested they are some of the Burt reforms. Indeed, that's the interesting. So I, I decided to go at a rather traumatic moment of high Maoist Thatcherism, which is how I'd put it, um, uh, when Alastair Mill goes up, gets sacked. Because that all seemed to me had a drama to it. Do, 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 I mean, you, you, sure. you, you're, you're looking for a story, at least I am, not just a sort of conveyor belt yeah, I was looking for something, some narrative drive to it, I suppose. Why did you call it Pinkos and Traitors? Oh, because lots of other names got thrown out on the way. Uh, much more anodyne names. What actually. kind of names? Oh, the BBC Under Siege, um, Breaking the Waves. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember any of them. They were sort of anodyne names. And right at the last moment, there's this very... The, Pinkos and Traitors is a quote from a spoof uh, Dennis Thatcher letter to Bill Deeds in Private Eye, in which he says that nest of pinkos and traitors down at Shepherd's Bush, the BBC. We know that those views in those letters are pretty close to what Dennis Thatcher actually thought. I just thought that in my head, actually, the whole book had been an answer an interrogation, really, of the Conservative attack on the BBC and, indeed, the Labour attack on the BBC. So it's been an interrogation. So I came up with that and everybody said, oh, you can't possibly have that, it's far too provocative. People And some people have misunderstood it, so perhaps it was. Um, and then the BBC decided that that was good. And, I, and in a way, it's got a kind of joke in it. Now, if people don't get the joke, there's not much I can do. Do you think it. the BBC is full of pinkos and traitors? I absolutely show in the book that the BBC certainly was not full of pinkos and traitors. It just wasn't. I mean, it was that you can have arguments about liberalism, but I, mean, I don't. And But that's what one of the views that the Conservative government, bits that the Conservative government certainly had. Do you regret using the title? No, I think it's a wonderful title. It's got, it's got a joke in it. It's got an ebullience in it. Um, but quite a lot of Elderly BBC people have beaten me up and said, but we weren't pinkos and traitors. And, the, the, you know, you just have to go on to the, you know, the, 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 the flame side flap of the book and I tell you that it's, it's for a joke. So, you know. Tell us about the reaction to your book. Um, 
Well, one reaction by, as it were, non-partisan public reviewers like Bonnie Greer, I suppose Chris Patton was a bit, or Chris Patton and the FT, I mean, the reviews in the papers were unequivocally great. And beyond that, you know, sort of uh, praise the writing, praise the attempt to describe the BBC, um, found it very readable. So if you're, and that's without exception. Um, and then there were two other responses, um, one of which is, the, the book had, was a surprise. I mean, Asa Briggs is very big, you know, three, four hundred thousand words a volume. Um, I had struggled, absolutely, I can't tell you how I struggled with not only how I would be responsible to the standard that I thought that the BBC required of me, which was to try and be impartial, which actually mostly when people write books, they're not. They, academic particularly, just really have an argument and then they go a bit quickly. Um, and I'd struggled, again, very painfully, actually, with what, what I was supposed to be, be as the successor to Lord Briggs. Was I supposed to knit another stripe on the bottom of the great Brig, Briggs histories? But there were lots of issues that felt to me absolutely core to the BBC that the public needed to understand and academics needed to understand. You need, I needed to put programmes at the centre, not at the periphery of, of the issue, and try and put programmes and the structures out of which programmes get made and the structures of response to that into a much bigger picture. ASA had never looked at news values. The word news values never occurs in five volumes. Um, or, or a really newsroom culture. So, uh, uh, and, and, and secondly, I thought that the BBC abutted important arguments in the world, not just within the BBC. Um, so that when you were looking at something like Live Aid uh, and the Ethiopian story, which is regarded as iconic, nevertheless, it had this extraordinary impact on... Um, charities, which it, perhaps it's going to happen anyway, but it's the moment when charities stop being small and start being very big. It has an extraordinary impact on the bar, which is set, really, I think, for, for famine stories. You know, you, nobody can ever replicate the very particular conditions of that, those stories in Ethiopia. So that, that's a, and for instance, in that chapter, I demonstrate, all of my colleagues as sociologists know that the media don't have effects. Um, I, I, I trace the impact of those programmes right the way through to Cabinet. You can see Cabinet for the first time, because I did the work in the papers, responding to a programme, responding in terms of the aid it gives Ethiopia. That's, that helps you to understand why politicians get aerated, but also it makes a bigger case about when you're talking about the effects that the media might have. It's not just down, it's also up. Um, so I was trying always to make an argument, which I don't think Asa did, and I was trying to put programmes at the centre. And, and I think people, it wasn't what people expected. What kind of pressures have you come under uh, as a result of writing the book and the reaction to the book? Sorry, James, can you cut for a second? Yeah. Just need two more. I, I think one of the reactions that has been very interesting which again I completely understand actually, is that um, there's a very interesting issue of where authorial voice comes, where you put the voice in. Um, and I think in official histories, people expected to see, they expected it to be bigger, they expected, this is going to be slightly rude, they expected all sausages that were made well to have well-made sausages labels attached, whereas in a sense I thought I was arguing. Um, uh, of course, I've not worked for the BBC. I'm not. I've not. I've watched it from the outside. So I'm an outsider. If I, I don't know why 
Well, I, you know, I may be far worse than Peter Hennessy or Christopher Andrews, who are official historians of, you know, MI5 or Kevin Jeffries of MI6. Subsequently, I've understood that um, nearly all people writing official histories come under the most immense pressure. Um, uh, and I would say, so when I was writing it, I didn't come under pressure from the BBC to include that or not include that. There was fantastic anxiety around Northern Ireland. It was real anxiety and I had to negotiate that quite carefully and get access to state papers, which took a lot of time. Um, afterwards, there's been, there's been, I've come in for a hammering. Now, I understand why people's achievements that they hope to find there and that were real. Um, they find that upsetting. I understand that I've made judgments about really important things in people's lives. I understand all of that. I understand that I made mistakes. ASA made 1,800 mistakes. Nobody has ever complained of one of them. Not one. Um, because I think they didn't, you know, and I, I, I and, and, you know, uh, I don't, I don't really want to dwell on that, but, you know, Lord Asa Briggs on the labour benches, uh, a great historian, um, you know, vice, vice Chancellor of Sussex, Worcester College, the Open University, a great radical historian, um, but a great man. I'm just very evidently not a great woman. I'm just not. I'm, I'm a person who's done my best. And I don't have any of those defences that make people uh, kowtow to me. So I think that's not made it, that's not made it easy. And they've also they've made a decision that they now won't do another volume of the history until everybody is dead. Because I think they feel that... The BBC? Yes. So I think they think... Um, somebody at the BBC said um, if they'd have known about it, they'd have sent me on a, uh, on a um, they think all historians ought to be sent on a hostile environments course. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm sure I have made mistakes, but uh, I have come on, come in for, um, and what, the only thing that really upsets me about that is that the book was, as it were, perfectly honed for this moment. I didn't know that it would be. But by looking at the conservative attacks around the licence fee, around the charter, around, uh, uh, you know, the war in the Falklands and the conflict in Northern Ireland, um, the fact that the BBC was accused of being a traitor, that it was under fantastic political pressure, that the press was on its way to becoming where it is now, fantastically hostile for commercial reasons. I, I, in lots of ways, I produced a book that was, in, in which I was trying to balance, it's very interesting, I think I was trying to balance three things which weren't natural for me to balance. One of which was to take the conservative attack seriously, because I think the BBC failed to take it seriously in the period I'm looking at. But also, it seemed to me that was a, I have very clear, very, very clear political engagements and a role, and I was married to a leading Labour historian. You know, I, it, 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 my own views, it seemed to me I had to put aside, and that, that my job was to interrogate that conservative attack on its own terms, to understand it, not to dismiss it, but to understand it, because only if you understand it can you go forward. I think my second thing that I was trying to balance, which is odd really, was knowing that the period afterwards was even more contested than my period. The sort of John Burt period was fantastically contested and one of its things that it did was say that this period was awful. So I was trying to balance, were they right? Was this period right? Who was right? Did, out of which actually Mike Checklin comes as a kind of... Uh, John Burt says he's the Gorbachev. I don't think that's quite right. I think he was... Uh, and of course, Mike Checkland is also sacked by the governors, but how, do we have lament and 
whaling. We, we don't. So I was trying to balance things that didn't necessarily come naturally to me um, because it seemed to me... So I'm very critical of the BBC. So, I, you know, so I've been accused of being too pro-BBC. But I mean, you know, actually I'm very critical of it. But of course I believe that the BBC is an incredibly important, impartial bit of our national understanding of ourselves. And I, uh, I am in favour of the BBC, but I wasn't, I wasn't always in favour of, of, of the decisions it made, but I would try to understand them. I mean, I've got a passion to understand why people think, do things, not actually to condemn. Has the experience of writing the book taken a very heavy toll on you? <laughs> That's not fair. Are you okay? Do you want to stop? No, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, not at all. Sorry, let me just, I, I just gather myself and I'll be asked if I, I'm, I do apologise. I'm so don't, sorry. No, how don't, pathetic, don't. how weedy, no, how no, dreadful. No, no, not at all. Um, has it taken a toll? Yes, it's taken a toll because I, it's become, of course I've made mistakes and I've owned them. I mean, I think I've just absolutely gone out and owned mistakes. And some of those mistakes were absolutely mine. And some of them were because it was cut and edited it and I didn't know, and I should have had another process at the end. Um, I think the, attack has let I'm very alone you know I'm just a, I'm just a you know and there's bit, there is a really interesting which I kind of relish I absolutely relish I've always worked not in posh institutions I've evangelically believe in the capacity of teaching to inspire and elevate people yeah. Um, I've worked in non-posh institutions, I've worked in polys, I've, I've worked in a wonderful department which was the founding media department, but there is a kind of contempt, I don't come from the same... ...teens as some of the people. Um, and... Uh, I. You know, some people have great access to the media and they've used that against the book. And I found that, so I can't really articulate what I've done, but I found it uh, very, I found it quite difficult to find within myself. If you go on, say, uh, our Beeb, the answer to it, because it felt relentless, and it, and and I've had nine months when I thought I would be starting to write the biography of Hugh Green, or perhaps making cakes, or perhaps talking to my children, or perhaps actually having a holiday, you know. Um, and I found myself, you know, defending uphill and down there. Um, let's turn now to what you've learnt <laughs> about the BBC. Um, <coughs> do you think the BBC is independent? I absolutely think that the BBC has a really important independence, but that independence, like nearly all independences, has a sort of a number of... It's like... Uh, it's like um, the Lilliputians and Gulliver. There are ties, and those ties are proper ties, so the BBC has a relationship to the state. Of course it has a relationship to the state. That's not a bad thing. I think, but I think that, I think I really worry about the way in which some of those conventions are being eroded. But if you look at my book, I suppose people are always trying to erode them. One of the big discoveries was that the Labour government, uh, the late 70s Labour government, actually sort of, for financial reasons, because, 
inflation, which we can't remember, was spiralling out of control, um, considered basically making the BBC part of general expenditure. And they knew that that was so toxic. They had that in papers which had secrets. So I think the BBC's independence, which is the only... The three bits to the BBC's independence, one of which is it gets the money and it's allowed to spend it as it wants. Secondly, that the politicians take their tanks off its lawn. And thirdly, that it's essentially an editorial independence. Um, are under threat at the moment. They've always been under threat, but it varies. Do you think the BBC can ever be permanently at war with the government of the day? No. no. Well, and, and one of the problems about now is that the BBC, like all impartial institutions, uh, like the monarchy and the church, and indeed the civil service, is really stuck when there isn't a strong opposition. Uh, when the opposition is very weak or doesn't have purchase, it doesn't come anywhere. Because then when the BBC puts the alternative case to the government, it looks as if it is being the opposition. That was absolutely true in the early 80s. It seems to me it's a dangerous potential now. Because the BBC then looks as if it's being the opposition. And the BBC, if it can hide behind a sensible opposition, then it isn't so exposed. So would you say that it's because of the licence fee, it's only ever pseudo-independent? No. I would say that as one of those great fudges of the British constitutional way, the licence fee has given it more independence than any other broadcaster and longer survival than any other broadcaster and more capacity to innovate so it would be very interesting to ask what, is, what have governments stopped the BBC doing in the last, say, 15 years that it would have been very much in the national interest for us to do. Um, that, you know, is the civil service independence? These are, all, these are all things that we have to obsess about and worry about and be concerned about. And you have to say that too many appearances, even before the magnificent uh, uh, Ma- Margaret um, Chair of the... Hodge. It, too many appearances, even before the magnificent Margaret Hodge, are really damaging. BBC should not be held to account by politicians like that. You need to, them to move off. But the, you, independence, rather like democracy, is always is always a work in the making. It's always it always has to be remade. You never get there. You never get to it. So it, it's. It, it's a much more political, nuanced thing. And that's good. Do you think the BBC licence fee imprisons BBC journalism in times of crisis? I see no sign of that. I mean, if you looked at... Well, OK, let's, let's sort of... I mean, let me start from another end. Uh, the world is full of news outlets at the moment, but it is um, the journalism that supports that news is in radical, dramatic, and terrifying decline. You know, so there are lots of there's lots more news outlets. You can get news from everywhere, but the actual journalism, which is what I'm interested in, which is the investigative, holding to account, finding stories, both locally in most of Britain is in dramatic decline. Really no proper professional journalists. Great swathes of Britain now. And also internationally, for all sorts of reasons, not least the threats to journalists. So the BBC journalism remains a world-class bit of journalism, which we would lose at our peril because we won't understand the world, let alone the nation. I think in times of crisis, Actually, again, you need a bit of history. You know, in Suez, the BBC stood up to the government. The government thumped it. Uh, uh, the next director general, wonderful, wonderful man, uh, uh, Hugh Green, comes in knowing that he's got to kind of protect the BBC. Cuban Missile Crisis, BBC triumphant. Doesn't have a row with the government, does independent reporting, manages not to, manage 
our way through that crisis. I've just written about that really interestingly. Um, Northern Ireland is more like a cancer than a, a crisis. It's a long-running, sulfurous, difficult to manage, very, very illuminating for our present circumstances, fifth column at home, divided nation, difficult to difficult things on the ground. Um, I think the BBC both temporised sometimes and in the end rather triumphantly just believed it had to tell the story. So it, my answer would be it depends on the crisis and it depends on the government and it depends on but public information and an accurate testing of things. Again, if you go back to the Falklands, to cut an illuminating wall, BBC gets called a traitor. It does brilliant reporting on the ground. In as far as it's possible, you know, Brian Hanneran, Robert Fox, Jenny Abramsky running the news. Newsnight does wonderful reporting. At the centre, I think they lose, partly because of the government, they, they lose a proper judgment of the battles that are going on in Whitehall. And they get terribly done over and that damages them all. So, I, but I don't... How, how important is it to defend the licence fee um, at this stage of the BBC's history? Um, I would want to defend the principles embodied within it, uh, which is that it's, uni it produces, it's universal, so it produces a universal obligation within the BBC. Why? The BBC has an obligation, again, never perfectly done, to represent and bring into the national conversation weaker minority voices. It's a pure John, John Stuart Mill. Pure John Stuart Mill. You know, not just majoritarian views, but also mi minority views, oppositional views, weaker views. Views from the not sexy, older, younger people who so universality is very important. Um, that the BBC gets to spend it more or less as it, on the things it thinks it should spend it on. That's also very, very important because so that's related to uh, editorial independence. Uh, um, it, but it also has to be fair. And at the moment, young people, my, you know, my son's access, the BBC website all the time, BBC Radio 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the World Service, and 6, the whole time. They watch stuff on catch up. They don't pay licence fees because they watch it on their computer. They're not trying to avoid paying licence fees, that's just how their lives work. And indeed, the middle son has gone out of his way to pay the licence fee, even though he doesn't have a telly. Um, so that's no longer fair. So you have to have something that, when people are watching it, that doesn't mean that, uh, that, that is fair. And, but also because that pulls the BBC to represent those voices. That's, there's another bit. Do you think the BBC is too big? No. I, matter of fact, I think the BBC, I'm really worried that the BBC has been stopped doing some things that would have been in our national interest. The most obvious of that would be supposing it had launched a public service search engine in about 2001. What a different world we will live in. Would we be under the monopoly of Google? No. Would the values that could have gone into a public service search engine have directed people in a really interesting way? What a brilliant utopia that would have been. Perhaps it could do public service Twitter. So I think that as a piece of... It's very fitted in its shape and institutional form, oddly, for, something, for, for the contemporary world, because it both does abroad and the World Service, but also it has that fantastic reporting from abroad that comes back in. I was Last year I was in India, Kabul and Pakistan. I'm about to run a big conference, a South Asia conference for journalists, and the sense of the BBC as a reliable voice in those countries is amazing. That, of course, does us the most extraordinary amount of good. And yet that foreign is brought right the way back to domestic. So that's a, that's a, most institutions we have don't fit the style of communications of the modern world. Crime doesn't come from another nation, it's international. Um, problems can only be solved, as it were, globally. So the BBC fits that. 
So why don't we go with it? And I, I worry about where news is going and how it's being reconstituted at the moment, but I don't think those are things that we need smaller. Do you think the BBC is inefficient? Oh, I'm sure it is. But, I mean, it's a, it just had a report. I mean, you know, but only in the sense that you should try universities. I mean, institutions ha- always have bits of inefficiency. There's just been a report that says it delivers very, very good value for money. I think there's, a, I think there's another problem, actually. Um, I think younger members of staff who are on short-term contracts, actually particularly women I worry about because of a particular career that women need in order to have families, um, may not have BBC values in their DNA in the same way. That, that worries me. I think that... I'm sure, I'm sure that there are inefficiencies, but I'm not sure that those... For instance, does the Daily Mail have inefficiencies? Does the Daily Mail website have inefficiencies? Um, I, so I think we need to keep a, an eye on that, but I, I don't think that the BBC is peculiarly inefficient. And indeed, all of the recent scandals, oddly, emerged from... Um, for instance, Chris Patton, when he became chairman, trying to bear down on top salaries, and then that got out of hand. Why do you think the BBC found Margaret Thatcher almost impossible to deal with? Because, um, well, uh, in the BBC's defence, so did lots of other institutions, um, lots of senior civil servants find her very difficult to deal with. Uh, She's very, very powerful, fierce personality with who takes no hostages. Um, she, Douglas Hurd said Margaret didn't like the BBC because it, she thought they didn't like her. That was probably, that was the feeling she got from them. I mean, she'd get, I mean, she could be incredibly, and, 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 I mean, they had a real problem. And it's a really interesting, it's like the stepmother problem. Um, Mrs Thatcher motored herself on aggression. She liked to have enemies. Most of us like to have friends, but that's part of her extraordinariness. She kind of liked to have enemies. And the, the trick was not to be an enemy. And the BBC, I think at the top, frankly, never managed not to be an enemy. Um, now, would that have been, could you have held principle? I completely understand your holding principle on the inside. Um, that she's impossible to woo. There's a wonderful BBC memo, actually, it says she's a very, very difficult woman to woo. And they do try and woo her. Um, you know, it's, one, it's, it's, it's a good what if. Um, could another set of personalities, perhaps a little less hostile to her, have brought around? I think one of the things is Douglas Hurd said, who did lots to defend the BBC actually, so where's the Douglas Hurd now? Um, that you had to always sort of stand up to her, but you had to listen to her. But she was, she was very, very, very difficult to manage. So I don't know that they could have done but I know that they failed to do so. Would you like to put on record your assessment of the BBC Director General Alistair Milne, who was sacked at the height of Mrs Thatcher's power? Yeah. Um, Alistair, who I saw lots of times, interviewed lots of times, was a complex man who'd been formed, one argument is that he'd been formed really by Grace Wyndham Goldie, that the BBC was run in this period by two sets of people. One lot had been formed by Grace Wyndham Goldie, the other had been formed by Hugh Weldon. And that Grace Wyndham Goldie, who was the most extraordinary and formidable female inventor of political television and, and one of the many august women married to the BBC in a funny kind of way, but she's very, very terrifying and obviously magnificent and important person who I also, as a young woman, interviewed absolutely scary, um, that she set people off to glow in her eyes. And that was a quite competitive glowing. 
I think Alistair was an amazingly gifted programme maker with a real eye for really great programmes, which he edited and kept an eye on, and he knew actually how to nurture those relationships and protect those relationships. Um, a friend of mine, one of the people that worked on the project actually, uh, uh, was on a plane as a young uh, Newsnight producer, sitting next to Hugh Green accidentally to America on the day that Alistair's appointment was announced. And Hugh is completely ecstatic and says it's, you know, it's the first proper programme maker, he's really controlled the BBC. I think he was a brilliant programme maker. I think he was um, an honourable man and he, but he, I think he was, he wasn't interested in the other side of the BBC, which was the structures and relating to government. The most, and sometimes, and he, he, he could be, I think he was enormously damaged by a confrontation with Bain Tories at the beginning of the Falklands War. I think if Trethowan had taken that hit, he would have started off in a better mood. So he was bullied by these ghastly, ghastly conservatives at the beginning of the Falklands War. Really bullied. And somehow he gets bullied. I mean, he, that sort of sets him into a tone in which he gets bullied. He's no left-wing person. I mean, he's absolutely behind getting rid of the unions. He doesn't do much about it, but he empowers other people to deal with the BBC unions. He's no... Um, he, he, everybody who worked closely with him attests to a kind of boredom or frustration or misery at running the thing. And he very, very quickly loses the confidence of the governors. Now, he's got difficult governors to deal with. I can, I can understand that. But they're the only governors he's got. He's just got, a, he just, he, he's, he, there's no alternative. Because the BBC has also lost with Mrs Thatcher and doesn't regain until after he's gone, really, the capacity to talk to government about properly about who will be a governor, what kind of form. So, of course, he inherits Mrs Thatcher's belief that boards are to do things, not to represent things. And he, But he loses that capacity to have that really key conversation. So he gets... I mean, he's right. He gets governors he doesn't want... But, I mean, obviously I wasn't there, but um, a couple of the most sympathetic to him governors, including Alwyn Roberts, who's read the Welsh government, who's very, very sympathetic, very warm about Alistair, you know, just goes through the times when Alistair could have won the board round and doesn't. And when he, for instance, goes to the Peacock Report, which is, looks like a big tank, going to look at the licence feed, look at, look at advertising. Behind the scenes, Alistair's been rather good. He said, go and do some proper research, and he gives it to Brian Wenham. He says, really investigate the problems. When he goes to see them, they ask him, what is public service broadcasting? He says, everything the BBC does, rather abruptly. I mean, he's a shy, you would know better. Some odd mixture of shy, bullyable, abrupt, arrogance, it's some very odd chemical combination in him led him to be sometimes very charming, but quite often rather abrupt and dismissive and not, not plastic enough in the places he needed to be plastic in. Now, he said to me, I was always polite to the governors. That's not the issue. Being polite to the governors is is so. By the end of him, I think the whole place is is toxic. I think everything is toxic. The governors are conspiring, but not talking to him. Uh, the chairman, he's he's blighted by chairmen who are ill and die on him actually, and have got other problems really until he gets until Hussey and Hussey's there to appoint him. The go nobody's talking to him about what what's going wrong. They, he and Wenham and various people are plotting against the governors, I understand why. Nobody has th the entire structure of referral. This is such a BBC thing. Um, 
the entire structure of referral happens in the wrong place. It happens after programmes are made. So the BBC is always moving into defend programmes as opposed to own them as they get taken. So programme makers understandably feel done over by the outside world and betrayed by the BBC. That I, I, and they feel they're being censored. And that's a structural problem. And he doesn't really quite have that mind for the structural, where it is you've got to have referral, where you've got to own programmes. So in that period... Um, all, <coughs> res- all power is in a sense delegated to program makers and all responsibility for problems is held at the centre. Later it turns round, all responsibility is at the bottom and all uh, uh, power is at the centre. Both of those are wrong. You have to get that back, you have to get the structure that holds power and responsibility in the right kind of order. As a student of BBC Director General's Do you think Greg Dyke had to resign over the BBC's handling of the so-called dodgy dossier that took the UK into the Second Iraq War? No, I think... uh, Yeah, yes. I think he... I was... I was... uh... Okay, that's another of those great blizzards that go through the BBC. Great fires, great fire storms. So Greg arrives and he feels very warmly. He's just what the staff want. He cheers the staff up and he spends a lot of money. He has a new chairman, Gavin Davis, who's less of an acute brute than Christopher Bland and not new to. So you've got two new people, quite dangerous. I think he is most BBC rows, can I turn down this round? And in fact, I've written about this. Most BBC rows are not really about whether the story in the programme is right or wrong. Indeed, most BBC rows, it turns out that mostly the story in the programme is right. That isn't, and the programme makers think, but you know, these people were shits, or it was a dodgy dossier. They think that the story Understandably, because they're, they're, they're story owners, constructors, finders, you know, that's what... Most BBC rows, absolutely historically, are actually... They look as if they're about the story, but they're not. They're about how the story is handled up. And if you are going to accuse the Prime Minister of lying, which I am completely happy with, you have to do it in a fairly orderly way, because you shouldn't do it casually. Because it's... Somehow we've got a very um, degraded public life, I think, at the moment, in which we assume all politicians lie all the time and blah, blah, blah. But I don't think they do. And I think that sometimes opacity is sometimes absolutely what you need. You know, I I can't understand secrecy. I don't think... So I think it was a combination of how that story went out and then the handling of it upwards. And the fact that... Gavin, who's a lovely man, and Greg, who's a very charismatic, good sort of demotic, very demotic voice for the BBC, um, were both new to that position. And what they did was they de- defended the journalism, which is... And, of course, the journalism by then, that's the other interesting thing. In Mrs Thatcher's period, the exocets come in at the top of the BBC. They, they, go, right, they go right to the top. You, you know, Ingham phones up. It's, it's go to the top. New Labour learns that something else could be done and they send their exocets right the way down the feeding chain to poor damned producers who are making programmes who get very resentful because suddenly they're being done over. So there's a sort of... There's, there's a... I don't know, I don't know <laughs> where the Cameron government sends its exocets, who knows. Um, So again, there's a structural issue about a resentment that's growing up in the BBC and how these things are handled. And I think that in the end, Greg and uh, Gavin resign, which is pretty catastrophic in one way, uh, because it looks like a terrible crisis. I mean, um, because... Because they're not managing the relationship between the truth of the story and what's really going on above their heads well. Do you think it was politically possible for Gavin Davis and Greg Dyke to say, look, 
We reject the Hutton report. It beggars belief that the government was right about everything and the BBC wrong about everything. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Yes, and indeed my husband from hospital, the last thing he wrote was the thing defending the BBC and the Guardian about 10 days before he died. Um, defending the BBC over Hutton. I wanted to say something else, yes, which again please. is not at all helpful to the individuals in these terrible imbraglios, which is the capacity of the BBC to have its top decapitated is one of the reasons it survived over the last 70 years. And that sense that you can remake the BBC. I mean, it's very, very curious. We don't think that the NHS, somehow, we don't know who is the NHS, who's responsible for it. We don't, it doesn't have a head. And it sort of shambles along and we don't know quite where it is. BBC, we think of as one coherent thing because it has a head. And certainly people like Julian Legrand, who works on the NHS, has always thought that the BBC's capacity to actually lose heads and have heads, lose director generals and have them. Now, of course, it matters the quality of those people, the quality of the chairman, the quality of the director general, but that actually is an extraordinary, it's extraordinarily painful, unbelievably difficult for the people in those roles and has got more difficult. I mean, there isn't a director general since Alistair, or indeed from two, if not three, three director generals before Alistair definitely went earlier than they expected or were effectively sacked. And all director generals since Alistair, including John Burt, did not go when they wanted to go. This is such an exposed position. So that so I'm saying as a historian, something that's not comforting to any poor individual caught up in these terrible fires, which damaged them sometimes, I think, forever. I mean, not Greg. I mean, he's risen brilliantly, and we now think he's just absolutely defending British football and doing all the right kind of things. It's wonderful. Um, but it can be very, 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 very damaging. And I just say that's one of the mechanisms, as a historian, you can see the BBC survives by as a student of Director Generals, do you think that George Entwistle had to resign over the BBC's handling of the allegations of historic sex abuse at the hands of Jimmy Saddle? Uh, I think he had to go, probably. I think it was... I, I don't think it was fair. I, I'm, everything I'm saying is that none of these exits are necessarily fair, but, they know, but, but the institution survives through them. Um, I think... The, it was terribly unfair because he was so new in. It was terribly unfair because he wasn't a vile man, he was not a good man. It was terribly unfair because he was chosen not to be, a, he was chosen to be more demotic, less tricky, more in, to, to grow into the job. To, and, and he never had a time to do that. And he was, destro he was destroyed completely unfairly. He's not, I mean, he's not an evil man. He's not, not done anything evil. But the handling, not of the historic sex abuse, but of the programming over that autumn, was a problem. And I think there was a kind of panic. Poor man, he got a crisis too soon. He had no panic button mechanism in place. I feel fantastically sorry for him. But he's, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. He'll re-emerge. Do you think the BBC knew about Savile's behaviour? When it was happening? Yep. That is a very complicated question. Um, none of the papers that I have seen, of which there are not many, but I have seen, as far as I know, all of the papers about Top of the Pops, about the Paola scandal, which is quite early, 69, about... Jim will fix it. I've seen all of those papers. There's, 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 there's one memo that with hindsight you would perhaps think was a bit iffy, but only with hindsight. If, if you would never in a month of Sundays have thought there was anything on paper. But of course Light Entertainment didn't write anything down. I think that... I think that... Um, 
I have very good evidence in my book, um, most persuasively from Helen Pennant Ray, who I think has been a complete trooper, actually, very, very brave woman, who worked with Savile on Speakeasy for two years, and who's a completely good egg. She's completely, you know, sensible, intelligent, motherly, concerned public service person. She worked with him for two years, and she thought that he was very professional, particularly at giving working class young people a voice. She never noticed anything. Now, so I think in that sense, there were lots of people who never saw anything that they understood at the time to be abusive. If you look at um, Dan Collins' very, very good book on Savile, of course, this was true in other institutions, some of which um, it was true in the NHS, it was true in the newspapers, it was true, that, that, you know, it, that was true in Mrs. Thatcher had him frequently to Christmas parties, not to Christmas Day, but to Christmas parties. Absolutely true in places like Stoke Mandeville. That, that, that they somehow didn't see it. Now, was there evidence that they should have noticed? I think you probably now say yes. But if you go back to, say, that Paul Theroux interview with Savile, this is a man, which is somehow the, the nearest one gets to a confrontation. Um, I, th I think that, that the, I think that the I think that the BBC thought he was odd. I think that the music industry, which actually in a funny kind of way he's not really part of, he's really pre-pop pre industry. That's what's so odd about him. I mean, he's a DJ from Manchester. He's kind of too old for the pop industry as it really takes off. Um, that had different mores around it. I think. So I think the BBC, I think lots of people can genuinely put their hands on their heart, whether they'll be believed and say, I didn't see anything, I didn't understand. Some of those are incredibly decent, honourable people. Any of us have to assume that we might also, that, that we're no better than them, that we wouldn't have assumed that. That the BBC didn't take some of the evidence that was around more seriously, I think, is a problem. That the BBC made two programmes, one of which was The World of Jimmy, Jimmy Savile in 1972. The other is a very, very troubled Anthony Clare in the psychiatrist chair, both of which go right to the edge of asking Savile really pertinent testing problems about his lack of a private life, about his devotion to his mother, about an abusive childhood. But Almost by definition, they assume that the answer is he's a very sad and miserable person who is driven in an odd way to all these philanthropic goods. Not that he's an abuser, because they couldn't have gone out if they were abusers. So the, the British public has a narrative around him, which is that he's sad, not that he is utterly evil. Do you think the BBC turned a blind eye? Um, the BBC was quite good at sacking people if it thought they weren't good, or they were doing or breaking or closing programs. I mean, th there's, a, there's an alternative narrative, which is, which again is kind of very difficult to put together, which is the Esther Ranson child line. So while they're, d did it cut blind eye? My concern about all of this is an odd one, really, which is that I imagine we are all now turning blind eyes to horrific abuses that we are not seeing. The most obvious of which, actually, is the export of sexual abuse on the internet to children in other countries, which has grown exponentially since the 80s. So there is, a, there is an extraordinary area of abuse, but we, we, we kind of are obsessed about the past here. Um, so I think, look for the moat in your own eye, what aren't we now looking at, is, is, would be my problem. So I, I, I think in, in as far as it did, it was culpable. In, in as far as it didn't see things, it was culpable. Um, I would like us to conclude from that, that we have to be more rigorous about the abuses we don't notice ourselves. 
Was BBC talent untouchable in the period you covered? It, talent is quite often untouchable. Mm. Owing to what talent is a bit rare. Um, I think the BBC has, <coughs> has a problem, which is distinguishing between the talent it makes and the talent that is really talent. It, 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 you know, the BBC can add royal jelly and exposure and mm. paint political commentators, you know, DJs, uh, presenters, it can paint them on lots of things and then they become... So if you looked at Jim or Fix It, what's brilliant about Jim or Fix It, uh, to which the girlfriends of all my sons endlessly applied with dreams, is it's the most amazing format. It's a really brilliant BBC format, perfect, wonderful format, public spirits, public service, fun. Was Jim the only person that could have presented it? That's a what if. So I think the BBC, I mean, I, 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 I think talent, as we've seen with Jeremy Clarkson, who I think is a real talent, though needed reinventing in some ways. Talent is, is quite difficult to manage because it's, it's not that ubiquitous. Why do you think the BBC self-censored the BBC Newsnight story about Savile's behaviour? I mean, the most, most inexp inexplicable, terrible decision made by Helen Bowden's a very nice, very decent BBC person. Um, because it wasn't concentrating enough. I mean, it was the most... That's, 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 there are two real catastrophes. There's that and the uh, uh, McAlpine. It, it, uh, the Macau, 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 it's unbearable for McAlpine, a dying man accused of paedophilia. Just unspeakable, and he was then very magnanimous. Um, I, I think that decision... I'm going to get into hot water here. I think that the material... My understanding is that the material had not been looked at properly. And you would know better than me, that you have to look at what the film shows you, not just hear the byline on it. And when you saw the witnesses in that film, I think they were very compelling, and particularly one of them, very compelling and very articulate. My understanding was that that material had not been properly looked at. Uh, uh, that, that was a really big error. You, should, you always have to look at telly, don't you? You always have to look at it, please. Um, and then the decisions get made too casually. Uh, so I think that was really an awful set of decisions. I'd like to ask you just a few questions now about the BBC today and the battle that is ensuing. Do you think there is a plot to kill off the BBC? I don't know. Do you want me to stop the washing? It's the washing <coughs> machine. Do you, do you want me to? If I open it, do you? Sorry, it's yeah. just it's whistling. I think you don't want what we've got. Yeah, no, it's um, it's the last four questions. It's a brilliant interview, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay. Do you? Sorry, can I... Yep. Sorry. Do you think there is a plot to kill off the BBC at the start of the twenty-first century? Um, we'll see. I think that um, it's very difficult in the current climate to assert the national interest when the BBC stands in the way, I, I completely understand actually, uh, of the commercial interests, particularly mm. online, of a set of newspapers. I mean, it's completely legitimate that... Mm. They object to that. Mm. Whether it's legitimate that the newspapers use themselves so uninhibitedly against the BBC is another issue. So I think there is a very powerful, much more powerful than before, mm. commercial imperative which is being used against the BBC. I think that the public 
has almost no venues. I'm really worried about that. I think the public has, there is no platform for real public opinion to be voiced. Everybody was moaned about the BBC, I suppose, because we love it and we own it. So that, that is another real anxiety. Where, where can you look around for a public, for the, a venue for the public to express their views? Um, I think that I worry about the calibre of the discussions going on in government and um, a much denuded civil service about a bit, a, a bit of national kit. And there are certainly a set of political enemies, including, as it were, the SNP um, and bits of the Conservative Party uh, who coalesce less in hostility to the BBC. People really don't like hearing the other point of view from their own. They find it really unpleasant. And yet that's what the BBC that is there to do. Um, whether the forces, it feels to me like, for instance, we've now had two licence fee muggings, one in 2010 and one three weeks ago. Those were muggings. They were muggings because the Treasury needed to save money. And the first time in 2010 for the Defence Review, this time because the government's got to save lots of money. Um, and all of this, you know, we live in a process-driven world, all processes ignored a mugging. Um, did the BBC get the best deal it did? It could have done, yes, I think Tony Hall made a mistake by not saying this was an improper process, but this was the best deal we could get, which is how I would have played it. Um, we will see, but I do not feel I do not feel, which is one of the reasons why, why the attack on my book is quite annoying, because in fact, in a funny kind of way, my book is poised to explain to you why you might want, nevertheless, to preserve this national bit of kit, despite. And all of the attacks, like, is it too big? Is it too popular? Is it a traitor? What's impartial news? That, 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 all of those things are investigated there. I don't feel a strong coalition of defence and the lack of Liberal Democrats in the government. Over the last, in the last government, the Liberal Democrats actually did defend, and indeed right the way back to the SDP, as a matter of fact. There's a long DNA of protecting the BBC right the way back to the SDP, which is really interesting. We've lost that. So I look around and I wonder where the defence of the BBC will come from. Whether there is a plot Uh, is another matter. And um, somebody once said to me, no minister wants to have, I was, I was the person, I, you know, nobody wants on their obituary under this man, the BBC was finally killed. But you can kill the BBC in all sorts of little ways. Do you think the BBC will see this attack off? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, I think, I think it's the most, um, not least because the licence fee needs readjusting. I think it's the most, well, yeah, I think it's the most challenging period since the period I wrote about. And the attack is more difficult for the public to identify. When it was Mrs Thatcher, even if people, biffing, a bit easy, even if the public agreed with the biffing, in a funny kind of way, they knew where it was coming from and they knew she had her interests. Now, the attack is much more amorphous, much more commercial, m much more um, opaque for the public to identify. Jean, many, many thanks. <laughs> Just pause for a second. It's an outstanding interview.